Oh, man. I am, um, ooh, yeah, I just feel the spirit of God this morning. I'm excited for what God is doing, what God's going to do. I'm just feeling it. You guys feeling it? Yeah. I'm feeling it. I feel the power. Uh, my first question for you, and I do have a question. Are you watching closely? Oh, are you paying attention? Okay, as weird as that question is, that's one of my favorite uh, movie starters of a movie. It's a real thinker movie. Uh, for those of you who know me, that's not surprising to be like, ah, Jake watches movies? It's like, yeah, well, 90% of what I say is probably a movie quote to some degree. But uh, one of my favorite movies famously starts off that way, are you watching closely? And it's um, Michael Caine. So I guess, are you watching closely? <laughs> How do you, Michael Caine. Yeah, and um, he ominously asked that. And of course, when the movie first premiered, uh, I'm sure every viewer in the theater was thinking, Yes, Michael Caine, we're watching closely. But I'm also sure, like me, the majority of viewers realized by the end they had not been watching closely. Uh, the very first frame of the movie significant, revealed the significant twist of the whole movie. But due to how out of context and seemingly random that first shot was, I think everybody in the audience could have said, no, we were not watching closely after the movie was over. So... Along these lines, about 20 years or so ago, an experiment was conducted uh, by a pair of cognitive psychologists to test people's selective attention. This thing called selective attention. They sat the test subjects down in a room in front of a screen, asked them to watch a video. Uh, essentially, when they sit down and watch the video, they go, okay, you're going to look at two teams. One team's wearing a black shirt, the other team's wearing a white shirt. And they're going to be passing these basketballs back and forth to each other. We want you super astute attentive people to sit down and watch this video and be able to tell us exactly how many times basketballs are passed, period, like between the two teams. Uh, the people sit down, and they're like, okay, yeah, we can do that. Sweet. So the video starts. They're watching it. They got their notepads out. They're counting. They're counting how many times, you know, how many times they're watching these basketballs go back and forth. So at the end of the test, the proctors go back to the test subjects, and they ask them, all right, guys, how many times were the balls packed? Pass back and forth between both teams, like cumulatively. What's that number? And the guys are like, 119, or whatever the actual number was. Not sure what the actual number was. And the test proctors are like, sweet, great, that's correct. And how many times did the gorilla enter? The gorilla? I don't <laughs> yes, how many times did the gorilla enter, and how many times did he beat his chest? Um... So, obviously, the guys are like, uh, okay, there was no gorilla. Surely we would have noticed something so obvious as a gorilla entering the frame. Like, we're watching guys pass basketballs back and forth to each other. How are we going to miss this gorilla? Well, it turns out, as confident as the test subjects were, that they would have noticed something so obvious as an inhuman, hairy gorilla breaking into the shot, beating his chest a couple times, and then leaving the scene... They would have noticed it, but it turns out they did not notice the gorilla. The tests the psychologists were conducting helped prove the point that humans have a pretty bad case of selective attention. When we get laser focused on certain things, we have a great tendency to blatantly miss other major important details around us. If I recall, the test had the purpose of being used um, as research-based data to support, like, no texting while driving. Because everybody who texts and drives are like, I can, I do pay attention. I have a great attention span. But it turns out that we actually don't have that great of an attention span. We just, it's, we really don't. And a lot of the times, like, there's, you know, TV shows about the people who have, like, superhuman abilities to observe things that the common person doesn't observe. But the point here is being that when we are laser focused on things, we can't help but not notice things, no matter how obvious it may seem that they would be, like a gorilla. So while you know the psychologists had their own agenda and message they wanted to peddle with their findings, I bring it to us this morning to simply ask this. Are we so laser focused on certain areas of our life that we blatantly miss other major important details around us? Are we so laser focused on the things that keep us busy, that keep us carnal, that we miss God? Have we perhaps lost our sense of awe and wonder in our worship because we're so focused elsewhere? 
Does that question make sense? So my goal this morning is to inspire us to regain our awe and wonder. Um, so we had to, uh, two rather important clarifications I got to make to begin. In order for us to like get on board with like a message called like regaining awe and wonder, we kind of have to have like a baseline agreement that it's been lost at least at some point, right? In order to regain something, we have to have lost it, okay? Um, and in this case, we've got to examine the possibility that some of us might have lost our sense of awe and wonder in worship. And awe and wonder really is worship. And so the next question that you might have that needs to be clarified is like, okay, well, what do we mean by awe and wonder? Like, how are we going to define that? Well, admittedly, the phrase exactly as it is in that or order, awe and wonder, is kind of like a, ch a thing churchy people say. Like, it's not, you, you, it's rare to actually find it exactly placed just exactly as so, awe and wonder, in the Bible. But the idea of awe and wonder is 100% in the Bible, when we say something is awesome, right? Like English kind of like diminishes what awe is. Uh, but both awe and wonder are pretty natural knee-jerk reactions to things. It's not really like an intellectual thing that you go, like you look at something awesome, something that would make you full of awe. Awe is not like, ooh, I, I am thinking very, wow, I was really getting my gears going. No, awesome is like, wow! Sorry, <laughs> there's a compressor on this microphone. <laughs> Jake's preaching today. Yeah, but it's it's that wow. I, I I cannot believe that. Like I don't know if you guys have ever had like your breath catch or something when you look at a sunset, right? Like that's awe. Like whoa, wow, right? We have awe and wonder for like you know, in the long run, semi mundane things. You know, like a, a, a sports activity. Somebody like you know does a backflip over the head and kicks it into the the goal. I mean, those guys saying goal, they're filled with awe and wonder, right? Goal! Like, I mean, that's, <laughs> what else keeps your breath going for that long but awe and wonder? So we also see them especially in reference to worship. So like when you see fear in the Bible, for example, like the fear of the Lord uh, could easily be changed out for awe, right? Fear is like a deep, often when the Bible says the fear of the Lord, like fear is a, is a part of awe to a degree, right? Mm, maybe I'm losing some of you here, maybe. But like, so for example, like I don't know if you guys have ever like looked at the stars, for example, and ever th thought about the fact that most of the stars out there are actually larger than our sun, and yet they're little tiny specks, right? But they're only little tiny specks because you're all the way down here on Earth and you're this little person, like in somewhere you're on it. Like you couldn't even get a tack to represent you on the world, right? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, so you ever looked, done that before? And like as a middle schooler or something, you're looking up at the sky and you're like, I'm, I'm, I'm significant, right? Like there's a, <laughs> it's a little tiny voice, little tiny text, I'm significant. There's a sense of like, while it's awesome, there's a little bit of fear of that. There's sort of the realization where you go, this universe could crush me like a bug. If God so wanted me to, I'm not even a bug. I'm not even an amoeba, right? Like, you're, that, that there's a sense of fear in that, right? Making sense so far? So uh, here's just a couple of phrases, that, uh, verses in the Bible that I think are particularly powerful that put this in a nugget for us, shall we say. Uh, Luke 5.26, an amazement seized them all. And they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, we have seen extraordinary things today. I like that word seized. Amazement seized them. Amazement, wonder, awe. It's those things in us that don't need any prompting. They express themselves naturally in the moment. Um, Psalm 33, 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Why? Because, this is Proverbs 9, 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. And I like how, like, semi-obvious, that is, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The ant doth not quarrel with the boot, shall we say, right? So but it's best to maybe fear the Lord. That just seems, that seems like the first step of wisdom, right? I'm not going to pick a fight with uh, the guy who made all that, okay? Romans 15, 3, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. I love this one from Romans because it 
gives us this idea of an intentional, supernatural filling up of awe and wonder. It's a God-given thing to be filled with joy, to abound in hope. And I think this last one might be one of my personal favorites. This is in Hebrews 12, 28 through 29. We're singing about this this morning, actually. I love how that works. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. What is the acceptable, worshipful response to God who is a consuming fire? Reverence and awe. Awe and wonder. Um, So if awe and wonder is a natural gut response to our God who is a consuming fire, how can it be even possible to lose it and be in need of regaining it? It goes back to the little selective attention anecdote that I shared in the beginning. You can only react to what you notice in the first place. Your reaction, whether you want it to be or not, will be awe and wonder when you encounter God, when you notice God. So an absence of awe and wonder, therefore, is a symptom of this selective attention. You're not reacting to God because you're not noticing God. You're not reacting to God because you're not noticing God. Okay, so let me, more anecdotes to help you um, (laughs) understand at the risk of offending some people in here. Uh Uh-oh, okay. In a good way, maybe. I don't know, is there a good way? Okay, so have you ever been around someone? (laughs) If Derek was here, Derek would be looking at me like, stop. Have you ever been around someone who is clearly reacting to something more profoundly than you are, anything, not even just worship. I mean, somebody who's just like, wow, about something that you're like, cool, what, what, what? Okay, so, okay, I'll start with the, with my, the non-offensive side first. So, when I'm watching like a band, like a live band and they're jamming, I'll be hooting and hollering at all the weird places, right? Like I'm watching like a bassist do a groove. I'm like, oh, yeah, woo! And everyone's like, what, what was cool about that? I'm like, oh, the, the, the slide, and it just went into the, ah, it just went into the minor third, and it's in the different key, and the, oh, man, I just love that. Oh, and the five of five, let's go. And everyone's like, oh, this guy over here, right? Like there's, like, like that gets me awe uh, and wonder, right? So, okay, and then this is where, uh, you know, okay, when I nerd out about American literature, right? And I'm like, oh, Oh, this the, the word choice here, how it just, mm, it just brings the author's intent like up to the page. And my students are looking at me like, and when are we going to use this for our lives? Like they're, they're obviously not filled with awe and wonder about like Poe or Steinbeck. So <laughs> not sure what that's about. Um, but their lack of reaction doesn't make what I'm reacting to less powerful. Does that make sense? It's, it's just they're simply not noticing the, the, the catch, whatever it is that is worth the reaction. Okay, on the flip side, Formula One. <laughs> NASCAR in general. Okay, so I'm sorry. I'm offending people who are very <laughs> – I can't look at Rich right now. He's looking at me like, where are you going with this? Okay, so – these these people that I love, that I share my life with, right, they react to stuff in those races that I am certainly not reacting to. Right? Like, oh, wow, oh, man. And I am over here like, great, they can drive in circles. And they're making money doing it. Why did I go to college? Right? Like, there's, <laughs> there's a part of me that is like, they notice things about the races that I, I don't know. They know the inner workings and the planning and the skill that it takes to do what those drivers are doing. They have a much wiser appreciation for it. Therefore, they react to it. Have I lost you with the NASCAR and stuff? Does this make sense so far? So when you notice things and you know something about them, you react to them. It's a God-given ability. When a line drive is rocketing at you in the infield and you notice it, You're going to react before you know to give your body the proper responses to do it. The pitchers in softball are like, well, sometimes. (laughs) Sometimes. On wonders the same way. You're cheering for a touchdown or the home run before you can even send the command to your lungs to get ready for a bellow. So conversely, when you don't notice things, four, 
You don't react, plunk, <laughs> right? And it's going to happen. This is an important point to get in our heads. Just because you don't notice something doesn't mean it's not there. Pull the golf ball out of your head, plunk. Just because we don't notice something doesn't mean it's not there. And while that may seem laughably obvious, it, it bears repeating. How many times have you thought in your heart, said in your heart, even said in your mouth, where is God? Why, why wasn't God here for me? Why isn't God working in my family, in my city, in my nation? On one side of your brain, you might intellectually understand that God is omnipresent. So, of course, he's everywhere. But because we don't notice him, we instantly behave like the test subjects in the earlier experiment and think, well, if he was there, surely I would have noticed him. But we don't notice everything, do we? We'd like to think we do, but we don't. God wants you to react to him with awe and wonder. Why? Because he's all-powerful and all-knowing enough to know that he's the best thing out there. And this is going off my notes a little bit, but I've been feeling this all week. Like, we're spiritual beings, right? So I don't know if you guys have ever felt the presence of God before, but when you, like, when you worship and you st- you actually just go into it with abandonment, where you let go of the, the fear that tries to get in the way of your worship, like what are people going to think, like blah, 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 and you just step into worship. It's like your soul rings like a tuning fork because it's finally in the place where it was designed to be. And I hear preachers who preach about worship uh, all the time reminding me that, you know, yeah, worship is for God, but God wants you to worship for you as well. It's like stepping into your purpose and the things that happen to your body, even on the science side, as Shayla has talked about, that actually happen for the benefit and just set your body right and your mind right on the things of God. So worship is for your benefit. And unfortunately, you know, we're also people who fall for you know, sales stuff, like I always have to, you know, I feel like I have to give you the benefit of, you know, worship for you to actually do it. But that's just, you know, it's just, it's the way we are. And while I'm over here geeking out about like a bass groove or a guitar solo, God's over here going, yeah, but wait till you get a load of this. Does this make sense? I'm I'm tracking so far. (laughs) You guys are the best front row ever. (laughs) Keep talking, keep going, just stop it, stop it. So, Here's, here's the thing, and I want you guys to understand this. Nobody needs to teach you awe and wonder. Again, this is a really natural response. This is not going to be getting up here and telling you how to react with awe and wonder. You don't need that. They're God-created reactions to the incredible things you notice or witness. So I think the part that needs to be taught, or at the very least recalibrated, is the distinction of what's incredible to you. The thing that needs to be taught, or at the very least recalibrated, is what's incredible to you. Because I think, again, this is not my notes, but it should be. We probably let certain things that should not fill us with awe and wonder fill us with awe and wonder. Right? We need to recalibrate what is awesome and wonderful to us. Who is awesome? Who is wonderful? So, again, sorry, Formula One and NASCAR is not incredible to me. But, see, it's not that it isn't incredible. My perception of it is just skewed because I'm lacking some significant perspective. I need to be taught about certain things of the sport to even begin to see the incredible. I remember going to watch the movie Ford versus Ferrari, wondering what I was possibly going to get out of it. But I walked away loving cars and racing suddenly. (laughs) Right? I was like, I think I love cars. And it was... But it was because it was taught to me in a medium that I totally understand and appreciate. Cinema, right? Screenwriting. Yeah. <laughs> Screenwriting. Acting. That's my jam. I'm such a nerd. Okay? So, it, like, it had to be presented to me in that way. So that's the beauty of what we do here on Sunday mornings. We seek the word. We hear the word. We teach, exhort, and admonish one another with all wisdom and with psalms and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in our hearts to God, as it says in Colossians 3. So... How beauty, how beautiful is the body when it all comes together. We teach and we remind each other about what's truly incredible. And just like the experiment I mentioned earlier, when we are taught what to notice, then we see it. So, uh, 
using an anecdote that Rich actually gave me from somebody else. So there's a, there's a pastor out there by the name of uh, Bill Johnson, um, and Rich was sharing me something that, uh, that Bill Johnson shared that I think th- that fits in right here. And essentially, there are these hunting dogs. What are they? Short-haired, German short-haired hunting dogs, pointers is what they're called. And uh, when they're uh, learning how to hunt and they're going out on their first hunt, the older dog with some more maturity, when he catches the scent of the prey, he stops and he points, right? He stops and he points in the direction of the prey. Now, the younger dog who's accompanying this older dog who's learning how to be on the hunt, he has all the same factories and all the faculties and um, senses about him uh, as the older dog. They can smell what? Something like 350% of what humans can smell, 350 times more. Um, So they, they can smell stuff from far away. So it's not that this young dog doesn't have the same abilities, but this dog is on the is on the hunt with this older dog, and it's all distracted. It's running around. It's playing around. It will not be the first to point. It will not be the first to stop and point. However, what happens with this younger dog is when the older dog, who is more mature, catches the scent and stops, and he points, the younger dog is cognizant enough to stop its playing and romping around, notices the point, honors the point by pointing and then catches the scent. Have you guys ever watched somebody else worship before and caught the scent? Where you've caught what's about them and what they're stepping into? See, this is the thing. While I might not have to teach you awe and wonder, there's certain practical steps sometimes that we just need to do in order to catch the scent of awe and wonder. And I think that's, that's what I'm driving at this morning is awe and wonder, that part, just like that younger dog, that younger dog, it wasn't that he couldn't smell the prey. It wasn't that at all. He had to stop for a second. Notice the right thing, honor the point. And then, aha, the prey, there it is. And then, so here's the thing. This also comes from Bill Johnson, too, and I love it. I just heard it this morning, like, driving up. I'm like, ah, thank you, God. And, like, God just, like, dropping that. Like, so he says this. The world operates and teaches you this, that actions follow feelings. Does that make sense? I feel something first, and then I act out of it, which is why I'm always yelling at home. And I'm always, you know, I'm angry, and I, so I, therefore I'm yelling. Does that make sense? So, but the kingdom teaches this value is that feelings follow actions. I act first, and then the right feeling comes. And that's totally backwards. It's totally backwards from the carnal way of doing it. But remember, we talked about this. What's the difference between an immature Christian and a mature Christian? You guys ever heard that before? We talked about this. I've talked about this before. There's like baby Christians. Okay, so the only, it's baby Christians is not how long you've been a Christian It's simply this. The Bible says this. Paul talks to the Corinthian church about like, hey, gosh, I'd love to talk to you about the more mature things, but you're still infants in Christ because you're still so carnal. You are still so obsessed with the natural carnal side of things that I can't begin to to talk to you about the spiritual stuff. So what, we, what ends up needing to happen for us is we need to honor the point. If we're super carnal and therefore not noticing God, noticing the spiritual things around us, then we need to honor the point and catch the scent. We on board? Ish? So could it be that we've lost some sense of awe and wonder because we've not given him that place of lordship in our hearts? What I mean by that is this. What if we've been counting how many times the ball is being passed instead of noticing the totally obvious gorilla in the background? What if we've been caught in a habitual pattern of noticing all the wrong things when God just wants us to see him and his work? See him and his work. Because if I see him and his work first, then all the other things I need to notice in my life will be taken care of. Does that make sense? I'm going to be seeing it from a God perspective. 
So questions like, what is this country coming to? What, what pointless, worthless questions? Okay, sorry, that offends some of you. But like, why? Why engage, why engage in that, right? Why, why engage with the, oh, kids these days? But, uh, no, stop, stop. Notice what God is doing, what God wants to do through you, and live that life. Live that life charged with power. You don't have to worry about what's going on here. It's like, well, whatever's going on over there, I'm about to change it because Jesus has the authority to change it. Amen? Amen? It's like, so it doesn't matter. Uh, oh, I'm just being cognizant and I'm noticing and I'm like, I, I want to know, I need to know all about this. I have books and books heaped about this. Stuff. No, no, no. <laughs> Reset. Like, God, what are you doing? And then, God, what, what truth are, do you want me to speak into? What, what, where do I, Jesus, where does your work need to be moved out through me. Does that make sense? Yeah. Am I just making people angry? I don't want to make people angry. <laughs> so our focuses can be so out of whack sometimes, amen? amen. Say it, say amen. <laughs> yes, totally. Sometimes it's like, uh, in, pardon another movie reference, but The Matrix. We've all allowed ourselves to be programmed to notice and react to all sorts of ridiculous, carnal, mundane things that are not even remotely close to what matters or what's real or what's spiritual that we are essentially living in another world, living another life, that we are not meant to be living. God has called us to something more, to be something more. It's time we started noticing that, believing that, and living that. Take the red pill, okay? Pardon if you don't catch that reference, but it's like make that choice, right? We are presented with those two choices. As silly as that movie reference seems, it sometimes is as simple as that. It's like, uh, this world is going to hell in a hell, ba in a hell basket. <laughs> Hand basket. That's what my grandpa always used to say. Or things of God, the kingdom of God. It's like when you, like, while one looks totally backwards, you know, with the action, uh, feelings that follow actions, like what's with that nonsense? When we step into that, we realize, whoa, man, God does have a plan for me. God does have all this together. For me, what the enemy intends for evil, God intends for good. This is all stuff that we understand. It's just intentional choices every day to do that. I, again, off my notes here, but I was sitting praying with my daughter yesterday, you know, and she was, she, she wanted to know where to find Jesus and because she was feeling lonely. And so, um, you know, a part of me was just, I'll be honest, at the time, it was like bedtime, and we just told her to go to bed, so I was wondering how much of this was just like a really weird way of stalling. <laughs> so I'm kind of looking at her like, oh, what? But when I actually sat down and engaged with her and I started praying for her, I just started crying over her because I just realized I want so badly for my kids to get this, what I didn't get as a kid. And I want them to be able to just be so confident in the Jesus side of the equation, that like little stuff like someone being sick or someone being a bully or someone walking in sin or anything like that, that it just it doesn't like, oh, it's life is so difficult where they just go, ah, oh, you know, feeling the emotion of Jesus. Because you got to remember Jesus, he wept about Lazarus, right? But what did he do? He raised Lazarus from the dead. So it's like, man, I want my kids to embody Jesus in that way, to mourn with those who mourn, who rejoice with those who rejoice, but not, you know, be stuck in the weeds of carnal stuff and just be like, God, where are you? Instead of just going, oh, wait, oh, hello, right? And just being Jesus. I want that for my kids so bad. <laughs> I done messed up, eh, Ron? Yeah. I messed up. You know, you're supposed to cry, like, while you're talking about it and not after. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Your life with God noticed in it is full of awe and wonder. And gosh, what a better way to live. Again, here I go, you know, telling you about the benefit of this, like a salesman. But, man, seriously, though. 
how much better is it to be full of awe and wonder than fear and despair? You know, like, ah, oh, just to be like, wow, man, this situation looks dire, but man, God is still so good. Life without this awe and wonder is just boring and mundane and fearful and despairing. You know you're living the boring, mundane, not the version of the life that you should be in when your worship is boring and mundane. You know you're living the boring, mundane life you're not meant to live when your worship is boring and mundane. Boring and mundane things get boring, mundane responses, if any response at all, right? I mean, I get the Formula One gets some real boring responses from me. <laughs> Cody's like, stop hating on that, man. <laughs> but is God mundane and boring? No, no. If you knew him, I don't think there's any way you could say that. So how is it that sometimes, maybe even oftentimes, maybe even all the times, my worship is so boring and mundane. How is it even possible that I could stand here with, you know, arms slack at my sides, maybe drool coming out the side of my mouth and like mindlessly vocalizing what the projector's prompting me to do? How is it even possible? But have we been there before? Oh, am I the only one? That's super awkward. I'm like, the only, not the drool thing, but maybe the everything else thing. Like if that's you, like you're not alone. I mean, I'm over here raising my hand. That should tell me only one thing, and it's not that God is boring and mundane. It's that I'm not seeing or noticing him, and therefore my reaction suddenly makes a lot of sense. Incredible things get incredible reactions, and they don't get reactions when they're not noticed. So just as it would be extremely difficult for someone to convince me of the incredibleness of something I think is boring, it would be difficult for me to convince you of God's incredibleness in your life if you haven't taken that to heart already. But here's what you could do to convince yourself. Just like Shayla was talking about last week and the week before, sometimes you need to take a moment and be thankful for the things that you have in your life. And what we talked about, like what she pointed out, gratitude and anxiety can't coexist in your mind at the same time. So how powerful is that? To just, to just be thankful. And with some exploration into what comes to mind, I know you'll soon realize that all, well, just like the Bible says, every good and perfect thing has come from God. And then you start seeing how God has been moving in your life through different situations throughout the years. Have you guys ever had those hindsight 2020 moments with God? When it's when looking back and you realize, oh man, God was so there. God is so amazing. He so worked that out. If I had gotten in the car just man, like a minute later, I would have been in that accident. Or you look back and like, I know Kayleen and I look back on our finances back in 2018 and we go, how did we make it? Mathematically doesn't work out. The numbers don't make sense. And yet God provided for us. So basically what I'm getting at here is what if instead of just always relying on looking back, what if you could look at right now? Where is God right now? Because if you can look back and see him, that means that he was there then. You just didn't notice him then. So it becomes just recalibrating. What am I going to decide to notice? His works are everywhere. The brilliance of his creativity and his artistry is evident in all creation all around us. What if you were to stop and look at like the, the trippy bug on the side of the path, right? And just allow yourself to marvel at God's creativity and his, his mystery and his insight? What if you were to escape somewhere where there's no light pollution and just allow yourself to be spellbound by the starry sky above your head when the sun goes down? In those moments, you could just let loose a sigh of worship and awe and wonder as you behold the incredible, vast, expansive works of your creator who, get this, counted it worth losing all that to gain you. You know, the Bible says that, that he did not, he, he did not think twice about becoming a man 
totally carnal like us, losing all that heavenly stuff to be with us, to die for us. Man, does that not fill you with awe and wonder? There is a problem with not noticing and noticing the wrong things. In Romans 1, you know, I think a student asked me one time, like, okay, well, what, what, what about all the people who, you know, don't ever see God or don't notice God? And it's kind of a hard truth response to that. And the Holy Spirit really brought it to me in a moment. Like, I'm not, I don't have Romans 1 memorized or anything like that. But it just came to my mind where I found myself opening up to Romans because I was genuinely curious. I'm like, hmm, for people who don't notice God, like what? What well, Paul says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. And that's echoed in Ecclesiastes 2. Heaven has been placed on the hearts of men. I mean, this is how people find God, right? You're born knowing that you're walking in this carnal thing and there's something else. And that's that tuning fork thing I talked about. When you step into spiritual things, you're like, whoa, the meaning of my life is suddenly crashing around me, right? For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him, honor the point, as God or give thanks. But they became futile. Listen to this. This is what I'm talking about today with selective attention. They became futile in their speculations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they really became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. I mean, is that not what we're talking about? You have a choice, and you're either choosing to be wise and exchange the incorruptible God for an image of corruptible man, or you're choosing an incorruptible God, and you're choosing to see him. And you have the choice daily to make the right decision and to see that. So I'm going to do something a little bit um, weirder here. Sound guys, I'm going to switch from this mic to that mic in just a moment. And guys, what I'm going to do is I, I um, in thinking about what practical ways that we can respond to this, you know, there's, you know, the Bible talks often about stirring each other up in the spirit, Right? And if we're not noticing God, and if it's hard for you to just look around and see God, I mean, hopefully it should be pretty easy most of the time to simply uh, to, to be able to look at something and be in awe of God. I mean, you'd have to be pretty far in your, your wise thinking of corruptible manness uh, to not, right? I mean, even just standing here in this building, there is the the, you know, a lifetime of knowledge and talent that has been given to somebody by God to create in something like this, right? The fact that we can even survive in Phoenix and Tucson when how hot it is, is testament to God's amazing feats of engineering, right? But sometimes there are times in your life where you're like, where? I just don't get it though. I don't get it. I don't know where God is. I, you know, I, I feel like I'm praying to him and he's not responding, but then you see somebody and out of their need, everybody needs something, right? Nobody in here is like got it all figured out. We're all operating out of some place of need, but there are some people who might be more practiced at this, more full of awe and wonder. They're the older pointer, so to speak. And so it's easy for them to just, boom, step right in and give God everything. And if that's not you, what do you do? Watch them. And honor the point, even if you feel silly. And start singing the song. Start worshiping. And it might take some time. There's so many stories out there of people just having to do the action 
and then the feeling follows, or the power follows, right? We're reading a book in the men's group about Todd White, and we'll see in his story that he goes to Walmart something like 40 times convinced that he can heal someone. And he goes 40 times, and 40 times he doesn't, like, see anything happen. And it's like the 41st time, suddenly someone's standing up out of this wheelchair, and he's like, oh, <laughs> right? But it took him the 41 times. I would have given up after one awkward moment, been like, oh, dang it, right? But he pressed in. BJ was talking to us, you know, earlier before the service, talking about how he spent, he spent a, a week, right? 40 hours, right? Is that true? 40 hours of just spraying, praying, interceding with God, praying in tongues. And it wasn't until the 12th hour that suddenly he was like lambasted by the Holy Spirit. And that might be the case for some of you. But the common thread through all of this is that each of these people are honoring the point. Knowing that there is something that these people got that I want. And I need that. That's how every person came to Jesus. There's something that guy has that I need. And they're not waiting around for him to like turn around and notice, him, notice them. They're noticing him. I just got to touch his robe. Guys, cut me a hole in the ceiling. Lower me down. Right? I got to get in his presence. So what I want to do here is there is, there's, um, I'm going to switch over. David, you ready? We're going to do a little worship workshop here a little bit. Is Richie in the house? You seen the kids? Okay, that's all right. No, it's okay. Maybe, uh, maybe Pastor, Pastor Mark, anyone want to get on the drums? Yeah? Okay. So we're going to take this thing for a test drive. You guys like test drives? Okay. Good, I don't, clearly. <laughs> this is the Formula One hater over here. But so there's something that we've, that we've uh, exercised in church before. You, you've seen us do this. And it's this, um, what some people might call spontaneous worship. Um, and it's actually a biblical thing. There are many Hebrew words for worship in the Bible that we have just kind of pared down to praise and worship, exhortation, things like that. But our words kind of are missing a word picture on one of these words. That word is tehillah. And what that word conveys is this spontaneity of praise and worship. That I feel like in our efforts to maybe honor the point, maybe this is where it comes from, when we have words on slides, you know, we're, we're singing somebody else's song, we're singing somebody else's revelation. While that's not always bad, there's something that we can recalibrate here in this moment to notice God when we just allow ourselves to even pray to music, to, to, to speak in tongues, to pray in tongues. The reason why we pray in tongues is that we can say things that, you know, we are not in an intellectual spot maybe right now to even comprehend, but it's just simply, again, that honoring the point, getting our body to do what it needs to do to be in the presence of God.